Solo leveling is one of the best performing manhwa of all time, and now the anime has taken the world by storm. It is pure power fantasy, and every part of me wanted to talk about the flaws and weird choices and lack of development in its characters, but like, if there are so many problems with the series, why wasn't I able to drop it, and why was I having so much fun when reading it? I think a lot of power fantasies get a bad rap in general, but when they're done right, they can easily be some of the most fun and exciting pieces of media out there, and so today, I want to cover the entire story of solo leveling and talk about what made this series so special. In the world of solo leveling, mystical gates have opened all around the world that lead to dungeons filled with monsters and rare gems. And at the same time, a portion of humanity has become awakened, gaining special powers that allow them to enter the gates and fend off invading monsters. It's a pretty simple basis for the story, and it really fits into that role-playing video game vibe that it's working towards. And I think this simplicity is one of the greatest strengths of solo leveling. It has this weird feeling of nostalgia while not feeling too crazy at the same time. It's easy to understand, and more importantly, it's easy to imagine yourself in. Plenty of other series, especially in anime and manga, have had that video game inspiration in the past, with some of the big ones being Dot Hack in the early 2000s and Sword Art Online in the 2010s, but by now it's so common to see a series like this that one comes out every year, if not every season. Shout out to Bofri if you haven't seen it, by the way. And a lot of these video game inspired series tend to fall into the isekai genre. Like, yeah, Kirito and Maple are just in virtual reality or whatever, but the entire story takes place in that other world. And while that is cool as hell, it also comes with this innate level of disconnection to it. We can imagine playing a game like this, but by like episode 5, we barely feel like it's a game at all, it's just another isekai. However, the vast majority of solo leveling happens in the real world. In fact, the only time that things stand out is when we're in a dungeon. You wouldn't think it makes a difference, but it definitely helps the story feel more grounded. You don't need to suspend your disbelief to make up an entire world. You just need to say dungeons exist, and then you're just ready to enjoy the show. But that all brings us to the main character and our self-insert, Sung Jin Woo. Awakened people called Hunters come in many shapes and forms. Regardless of their rank, they are all stronger than normal people, but the higher their rank, the bigger the gap. An E rank, for example, might be considered peak human condition for a normal person, while an S rank might be able to cast a fireball that incinerates an entire building. So where does that leave Sung Jin Woo? Well, our boy has the powerful nickname of the world's weakest hunter. It's to the point where Jin Wu being on a raid is actually a liability because the rest of the group has to babysit him the whole time. Quite literally every time that he enters a dungeon, he is either injured or nearly killed. However, because his dad is out of the picture and his mom is in the hospital, Jin Wu forces himself to enter the dungeon, knowing the risk that he is putting himself in just to be able to pay for his mom's medicine and take care of his little sister. I think a big part of what makes Jin Wu a sympathetic character is that he doesn't like going into dungeons. He does it because he has to, and no matter how much danger he finds himself in, he is always able to make it home and take care of his family. He is the definition of powerless, and when we're talking about power fantasies, that's actually a very good starting point. If Jin Wu is the weakest E rank in the world, that basically just makes him a normal dude. There's nothing special about him other than his willingness to put himself in danger for the sake of his loved ones. And it's something that any reader can understand and see themselves in specifically because Jin Wu is as normal as possible. Now luckily he isn't totally alone in dungeon raids, as he's often paired with a B rank healer named Juhi. We find out in the epilogue, but she was often assigned to work with Jinwoo specifically because he was always getting hurt. The story proper begins as Jinwoo and Juhi enter a dungeon under the C rank hunter Song Chi Yul. After defeating the dungeon boss, the raid group would find a second entrance, a rare case where a dungeon was found inside another dungeon. Mr. Song doesn't want to force anyone to press on against their will, so he puts it up to a vote, and Jin Woo would be the tiebreaker making the decision to enter as a chance to make a little bit more money for his family. Inside this second dungeon, they find a room adorned with statues leading to one giant stone figure on a throne, as well as a winged statue holding a list of commandments. 
These explain that they need to worship the Lord, praise the Lord, and then prove their faith. After reading these, the giant statue shifts his eyes, and here is where Jin Wu stands out. As he has always risked his life, he had built up a sensitivity to sensing danger. He had almost died so many times, and he felt that feeling creeping in again. Because of this, he calls for everyone to duck, and those who don't listen are instantly killed by lasers that shoot from the statue's eyes. It's here that Jinwu begins to understand that the commandments were rules for this chamber and tells everyone that they must bow to worship the Lord. When they do this, the lasers stop, but the Lord begins coming to life and starts walking towards them. Everyone runs away, but as they pass other statues, those start to move as well. With this in mind, Jinwu directs everyone to stand before the statues holding instruments, and they too spring to life and begin playing music, praising the Lord. However, despite being the one to solve this puzzle, Jinwu actually loses one of his legs in this test so that he's able to ensure his friend's safety. Finally, an altar opens up in the center of the room, and as each hunter steps onto it, a red flame is lit around them. Once everyone is there, a blue ring of fire appears, and the door to the dungeon opens, offering them their escape to freedom. The test here is to stay on the altar. With each person that escapes, the flames begin to extinguish faster and faster, and eventually those left behind on the altar will be killed by the statues in the room. Proving your faith is choosing to stay on the altar and not abandon the others. It is a test of courage. But things don't go that way. The hunters see the open door, and one after another they start running for the exit. Some even have the nerve to say that they need to escape for their family's sake, which completely ignores that everyone else here also has a family. Eventually, it comes down to just Jinwoo, Juhi, and Mr. Song on the altar, and the door is barely staying open. There is no longer enough time for all of them to survive, and so Mr. Song offers to remain behind because he's the leader of the group. However, Juhi is frozen in fear, Jinwoo is missing a leg, and they can't make it out on their own. So instead, Jinwoo tells Mr. Song to take care of Juhi, she is knocked out and carried away to safety. Jinwoo, just as he had for his entire life, was choosing to put others before himself. He even says that he is glad that he is the only one who has to die. However, as the statues start cleaving down on him, he can't help but resent those who left greedily and recognize that he is a liar. He isn't happy that only he has to die. He wanted to live too, and he begs for one more chance. And in this moment, he gets one. The statue's weapon freezes on its way down to kill him, and a notification appears before him saying that he has passed a secret quest and asks if he wants to become a player, adding that if he refuses, time will continue and he will die in the next moment. So obviously, he accepts, and this kicks off the main story. So, let's talk about the double dungeon opening arc. I think it does a lot of things really effectively. Firstly, it's exciting and it keeps you on edge the entire time. And this largely comes from the fact that we know Jinwoo is so weak. The same point which allows the audience to see themselves in the main character also allows them to feel the fear and frustration that he is experiencing. We can both celebrate his triumphs in solving puzzles and sympathize with his anger as he watches people abandon him on the altar. I think it's a very human experience to not feel like you are good enough to be overwhelmed and to be hurt by others, and we can experience all of that through Jinwoo. These can all be some of the hardest parts of life. This dude who was looked down on by everyone else had saved them and then been betrayed and killed for it. However, Jinwoo also shows us the best of humanity. He does everything in his power to help others. He genuinely cares for his family, and he is completely selfless. But at the same time, we get to see the desperation to live. Some of the last thoughts on his mind are that he can't lie about being content with becoming a sacrifice. And I think it's a very interesting and extremely human moment where you can act selflessly and put on a brave face for others, and sometimes that can actually really fucking suck. Jinwoo is a good guy, but he's not a saint. He's smart, but he's not strong. He is not perfect and he can make mistakes, but even so he is always trying as hard as he can and carries the burdens of as many others as he possibly is able to. And I think that all sets him up as a very compelling protagonist. When he wakes up, he finds himself in a hospital and is fully recovered from the dungeon. 
That being said, Jinwoo's second chance at life is the perfect idea for a power fantasy character. He doesn't become strong right away, he has to earn it. He ended up being found alive in there, but all the statues and monsters that the survivors were mentioning had completely vanished. And so, the Hunters Association sends Wu Jinchul to ask questions to Jinwoo. At first, they believe that he had received a second awakening. But after testing his mana and finding out that he's still only measuring a 10, they quickly dismiss this idea. For reference, the weakest that an E-rank is supposed to score on this measure is 70. So, having a 10 is pretty rough. Seeing this, Jinchul leaves confident that nothing has changed for Jinwoo, and to be fair, he is right. Right now, Jinwoo is not stronger at all, but he has the potential to be. By becoming a player, Jinwoo has earned the ability to level up, so while all the other hunters have their powers set in stone, he can continuously grow. On top of just leveling up, the system gives him a daily workout routine, and if he completes that, he can get three skill points to put into any of five categories. Those being strength, agility, sense, intelligence, or health. The game wants him to be a better version of himself, but there's no cheat code or easy way to get there. He needs to improve on his own and put in the work. It also doesn't allow him to slack off, because if he ever does skip out on his daily workout, he is sent to a desert dungeon filled with massive venomous centipedes who will chase him throughout a 4 hour penalty period. And let me tell you, that is pretty good motivation to get your push ups in. I don't know about you, but reading this gave me the same feeling I got when watching Haikyuu or other shows like that where just by watching, you want to put in more effort in your own life or go get some exercise. Watching Jinwoo grow makes you want to improve as well, in a way that just isn't present in many other similar series. If a character is always OP, you can't get inspired by their growth. Beyond just the three skill points, Jinwoo also receives a status recovery that will completely heal him and refresh him, as well as a random loot drop every day for completing these tasks. Because you gotta get the gacha element in there somewhere, that is how you get kids hooked on the game. After three days of training though, he gets a key which allows him to create an instant dungeon. And this is where his growth really begins. Inside, Jinwoo comes across a giant red wolf with a steel jaw called a Rykon. Thanks to his exercise and bonus stat points that he's received, he's able to dodge and fight back, as opposed to being completely dominated like he had been in the past. It isn't like he is just suddenly insurmountably stronger, but he's at least able to protect himself, and it gives him essentially a fair starting point, something that all the other hunters in the world had that he never actually received. But even with these new stats, he isn't able to kill the Rykon. However, the system does give him a bit of a hand here. You see, normally hunters go buy weapons and equipment to help themselves out, but because Jinwoo is so weak, and because he had to pay for his mom's medical expenses, he couldn't really afford to buy anything to help himself. And even if he could with the little money remaining, it was so low quality that it would just break right away anyways. In this battle though, Jinwoo opens the system's inventory and finds the sword that Mr. Song had dropped in the double dungeon. This is the really only advantage that the system gives him to start with. Not magic, not anything unbelievable or crazy, it brings him to the starting point that everyone else began at. He is literally only given things that other hunters who don't have his burdens would already have access to. Now, with this sword in hand, he manages to cut down the wolf and earns his first level up, but of course, things don't stop there. And he would continue to grind against the monsters in this dungeon until he reached level 15, and then enters the boss room to fight a massive serpent called Kasaka. Despite all of his leveling up, this is a rough fight. Kasuka is way faster than he is, his sword is so worn down by the monsters he has already defeated that he can't even leave a scratch, and did I mention, it's like a 70 foot tall snake. And so, regardless of all of his effort, Jinwoo realizes that he is still worthless. He thinks to himself about how much he hated being called the world's weakest hunter, and how he was ashamed because he knew the people calling him that were right. But not only that, even when he was useful, people around him still took him for granted. Back in the double dungeon, he was the one who figured out each of the puzzles. 
He was the reason that so many survivors made it out, but that doesn't change the fact that everyone except Juhi and Mr. Song abandoned him. And this is where Jinwoo forms his core philosophy. Power is something that trumps everything else. People can make strategies or stand up against terror, but power will bring everyone else to their knees. People might thank you for your wisdom or intelligence, but in the face of power, they will still betray you. And this is at the heart of all of Jinwoo's growth going forward. He doesn't want to be weak or looked down on anymore. He doesn't want anyone that he depends on to betray him. And to ensure that, he needs to become the best version of himself. He can't just become stronger, he has to become the strongest. Luckily, in this fight, he has something that does make him special. He knows what true fear is. Jinwoo had stood on death's door so many times and he had always made it out, and having come face to face with the statue of the Lord, he knew what true power looked like. And sure, Kasuga is terrifying, and it's way stronger than he is. There's no question there at all. However, in comparison to the horror of standing before the Lord, Kasuga is just another monster. And so rather than running away, Jinwoo runs towards the attacking snake, grabs onto its neck, and uses all of the strength at his disposal to squeeze down until he crushes it. And when he finally manages to kill the dungeon boss, he thinks to himself that he is so glad to have just become a little bit stronger. So before I get into the scene, I want to quickly discuss a similar moment in Sword Art Online. Yes, I know I keep bringing up the series, but it's the closest and most iconic parallel that we have, so it's just more useful than most other examples. Especially when we're talking about the early bits of Season 1 that was so impactful at the time within the community. Plus, let's be real, there are already so many Jinwoo and Kirito comparisons that it's hard to ignore. Now, let me set the scene. Kirito and Asuna are in this big raid and come across a surprisingly difficult boss called Gleam Eyes. And this monster wipes out the vast majority of their group. Seeing this, Asuna dives into attack and gets swatted away immediately, forcing Kirito to go in and protect her. But just like Jinwoo in his fight against Kasuka, Kirito realizes that he's not strong enough to beat this boss as he is. Then Homie takes out a second sword and proceeds to dunk on the boss. Comparing these two moments, which is cooler? Honestly, unless the animation studio does something crazy with Kasuka, I gotta say Kirito takes it by a mile. It's just so much more flashy and fun and exciting, and that is very hard to argue against. But which of these moments feels like the character has actually developed more? Jinwoo pushes himself to the absolute limit. He comes face to face with his own weakness and builds his whole sense of identity around his struggle in this fight. It is desperate and it feels exhausting. And on the other hand, we have Kirito letting a whole group of people die because he didn't want to show off his special skill or for people to know how strong he really was. Jinwoo is earning his strength, while Kirito is demonstrating his. It is a very small difference that speaks to the core difference in why, despite their similarities, solo leveling and sword art online feel so distinct. But going forward, Jinwoo begins thinking about the consequences of his growth. If the public finds out that he is the only person in the world who can continuously improve like this, then he will draw a ton of attention. Not only that, but let's say a more powerful hunter sees him growing and fears being outshined by the world's weakest, they may want to eliminate him out of jealousy or before he becomes a problem. Hell, it wouldn't even have to be another hunter. The government might see a hunter with this skill and see him as dangerous as well. With this in mind, he tries to keep a low profile and signs up for easy jobs. For example, he goes on a very simple and easy mission working for a C-ranked guy named Dong Suk. Basically, the law says you need 10 people to enter a dungeon for safety reasons, but Dong Suk's squad only has 8 members, so they need 2 more people to pad things out and who will carry their bags for them. This ends up being Jin Woo and a D-ranked rich boy named Jin Ho. In this dungeon, we quickly see just how much Jin Woo has grown. Despite everyone here being C or D rank, it is Jinwoo who first realizes that they are about to be attacked by a swarm of giant bugs. But the insects aren't the only threat here, there are also the lizards. 
Lizards, in this case, refer to the hunters who betray and kill other hunters inside of dungeons. And it's where the name of this arc, the Lizard Arc, comes from. When they find the boss room, Dong Suk and his men trap Jin Woo and Jin Ho alone with the boss, and then simply wait outside for them to die so that they don't have to split the earnings as many times. And let me tell you, if this was two weeks ago, Jin Woo would have been eaten alive by this gigantic spider in moments. However, with his newly earned strength, Jin Woo manages to shock everyone as he continues to get his ass beat. A C rank boss is still just too much for him to take on. But because he's able to think on his feet, he's able to overcome the odds. When he finds himself about to be killed, he uses his daily status recovery to fully heal. Then, using this opening, he leaps over the spider's attack and lands a chain of strikes on the monster's eyes. On top of that, Jinwoo's dagger is made from Kasaka's fang and has the special ability to either paralyze or cause bleeding on hit. By outsmarting the boss and procking these status effects, Jinwoo is able to take the spider down despite being weaker than it. Again, this is Jinwoo struggling against the boss but playing into his strengths, just as he did in the double dungeon and the instant dungeon. But he puts in work every day to become stronger, and still he isn't enough. So he has to make the most of his situation and create a plan to succeed. We're like 20 chapters in at this point, and while we are certainly growing, definitely aren't untouchable in any way. And I think this level of struggle being incorporated into his story really helps with the accessibility of solo leveling. It's escapism for the audience, but it's escapism with effort. The early stages of this story kind of take the emotional strengths from investing in a character's work from things like Naruto or even Demon Slayer. Because we see these characters working to improve themselves, they become more likable. And I believe that's why Jinwoo as a character is so much more compelling early on than he is in the middle of the series. Obviously, he gets way fucking cooler as he gets stronger. But the thought of him putting in effort gets a bit washed out as the series goes on, and he becomes less relatable as a result. Now, Dong Suk is obviously more than a little surprised when he sees the two hunters he trapped not only survived, but have killed the boss. He thinks that because Jin Ho had a bunch of fancy armor that he must have been the one to do this, and because of that, he tells Jin Ho that if he kills Jin Wu, he will accept him into the group and allow him to live. But Jinho just saw our boy drop a 30 foot tall spider on his own. He knows what this guy is capable of and he's trying not to cross him. And so he turns Dong Suk down instead. If you've been keeping track and think back to the revelation during the Kasuka fight, Jinwoo had stated that power is something that can make people betray you and the only thing that can guarantee they won't is to become powerful yourself. And this is the follow up on that idea. Jin Ho sees how strong he is, so he sides with him over Dong Suk. Power can keep your allies loyal. Now, Dong Suk and his men begin attacking Jin Woo themselves when Jin Ho won't do it for them, and the system gives Jin Woo an urgent quest to kill the hostile enemies around him. Seeing this, he begins to realize that the system needs him to be strong for a reason, and resolves that if the system planned on using him, then he will use the system as well. This battle acts as a bit of a turning point for his character, where he's forced to kill another person. Eight of them, in fact. It's the beginning of a mindset where monsters and humans are kind of seen in a similar way. It doesn't matter who or what is attacking, Jinwoo will survive at any cost and kill anyone who is trying to take his life. And finally, the third part of Jinwoo's core philosophy comes when he is fighting a monster called Cerberus, who is guarding a dungeon called the Demon Castle. While the strongest monster Jinwoo has come across so far had been a C rank, Cerberus is an S rank. And as you might expect, this fight does not go well. Jinwoo is basically ragdolled and thrown around, the doggo even manages to take a big bite out of his shoulder. However, as he is getting beaten down, he begins to notice that the system is automatically triggering skills like tenacity, this reducing incoming damage and keeping him alive. It is, quite literally, plot armor. But it is plot armor that is believable and that comes with a purpose. And in seeing this, Jinwoo begins to understand that the system is going out of its way to save him. He wasn't just a player, he was someone's avatar and he was very important to the game. And if that's going to be the case, he needs to exceed the expectations of whoever is in charge and swallow the system whole before he is the one consumed by it. Now, plot armor is bad, right? 
Well, it tends to be, at least. We often see plot armor taking shape in things like the power of friendship, which you hear about a lot in shows like Fairy Tale. In cases like that, the plot is being manipulated to protect a character, it's plot armor. However, here we have something a little bit different. This all-powerful system that has been established to need Jinwoo in some way is giving him a buff to help him survive. Firstly, it is self-serving. The system is a part of the plot which has been at least somewhat explored to this point, and the fact that it needs Jinwoo to survive has already been established. But you know what the most important part of that description was? It helps him survive. Cerberus brings him from 3600 health to 400, and then it triggers tenacity, which reduces damage by 50%. At this point, he is still dead if he gets hit again once or twice, and there is no active changes being made to help him overcome the battle. It is simply trying to give him one more chance. As far as plot armor goes, this is pretty inoffensive, and in reality, Jinwoo doesn't even take another hit in this fight, so the system trying to help him isn't even needed. This moment of plot armor isn't to actually protect Jinwoo, it's to reinforce the idea that the system needs him. And I think presenting it as plot armor is actually kind of genius. It's a really interesting use of a trope that often creates a huge issue or point of criticism in other stories like this. Now, once Jinwoo finishes off Cerberus, the demon castle is open to him, but based on the ass whooping that he just took, he decides to level up more first. More importantly though, this is about the time that Jinwoo is really starting to question the meaning of the system and why he was selected for it. And it is super important to bring this up now, as if I'm being honest, we're about three arcs away from hitting the point where Jinwoo becomes untouchably strong. So these early moments that plant seeds for future plot threads are vital in keeping us invested in more than just his power progression. This shift allows us to go from how strong will Jinwoo get to why is Jinwoo able to become so strong. It's a very small but crucial change in perspective. We explore this more as we enter the prisoner arc. This sees Jinwoo being reunited with some of the survivors of the double dungeon as they enter a dungeon with a group of prisoners who are trying to lighten their sentence by doing community work. The raid is being overseen by someone named Kang Taishik, a B-rank hunter who works for the association who is supposed to keep the prisoners in line. For Jinwoo, it's pretty nice to see Juhi and Mr. Song again, but he's less excited to see Kim Sang-shik. This is the dude who abandoned Jinwoo because he had family at home, and our boy is still holding a grudge about that. The arc quickly goes to shit though, as Kang has been hired to kill one of the prisoners because they forced themselves on a girl, and that led to her taking her own life. So, Kang kills the prisoners, but Kim ends up seeing him do this, and now he's gotta go too. And at that point, the whole raid might as well be eliminated in the process. Before Kang can make it to the rest of the group though, Jinwoo comes across Kim as he is bleeding out, and we see the protagonist in a very dark place as he says that he wants this man to live, so that he can continue hating him. And at first, this feels a little bit out of place, but looking back, hate has been a huge part of his character. Hating himself for being weak, as well as hating the people who betrayed him, and using that as a motivator to become stronger so it doesn't happen again. Which is why he is a little bit disheveled when Kim spends his last moments genuinely giving a heartfelt apology for his actions, leading to a moment of self-reflection in Jinwoo right before his fight with Kang. Now, as is tradition at this point, Jinwoo is completely outclassed by this B-rank opponent, and a big part of that is because he's been funneling most of his stats into agility and strength, but coming against a high B-rank assassin makes it pretty impossible for him to actually land a hit on Kang. At the end of the day, he's just way faster, and if Jinwoo can't touch him, all that strength doesn't matter. In a layman's terms, you can't hit me. And to top it all off, Kang has a special hunter skill that even allows him to turn invisible. Luckily, Juhi is there and she gives Jinwoo a support buff to allow him to keep up, but by using his own skill, Bloodlust, he's able to intimidate Kang to the point that he is frozen in place long enough to inflict paralysis and bleed against him just like he had the spider boss. As Jinwoo looks down on Kang dying, he asks, let's say I'm a hunter that improves with every battle, how much stronger do you think I'll get? And Kang remarks that his shadow has become one with darkness, and as a result he can expect to become as powerful as that darkness is deep. 
And yes, we do take the W here, but not without a cost. During the fight, Jinwoo actually notes something very important. Just after healing himself with status recovery, he says that another one of his emotions has died. Even after the fight, he remarks that I feel like something is destroyed inside of me every time I get stronger. While he continues to grow, Jinwoo can literally feel his humanity slipping away as the system slowly begins to consume him. And as if doubling down on that growing darkness, Jinwoo suddenly takes up the role of judge. To this point in the story, he has only ever killed other people who were a threat to his own life. However, after telling Mr. Song and Juhi to wait outside the gate, he grabs the man that Kang had been sent to kill. By some miracle, this dude had survived and was playing possum through the entire conflict. But Jinwoo spots him and drags him into the boss's chamber and throws him into the hobgoblin and his army. Jinwoo asks the man if he remembers the faces of his victims that he forced himself on and tells him that he is even more despicable than Kang, so he can't be allowed to leave the dungeon. Now, don't get me wrong, fuck this guy and anyone like him. I don't blame or judge Jinwoo for putting him to death at all. However, this is the first person that is in no way a threat to Jinwoo that he eliminates. It's the moment where he decides that his morality can be enforced on those around him. And while there are small individual cases that follow this throughout the series, we don't get a lot of moments like this, and I do think that it could have been a very interesting plot thread to explore more thoroughly. Now, I've spent a lot of time talking about what solo leveling does really well so far, but here is where the series actually pulls a bit of a magic trick. You see these characters, Mr. Song and Juhi? It almost felt like they were going to be coming back into the story, right? Well, solo leveling waves a tarp over them and poof! They completely disappear. We might get an odd cameo with them here and there, but they are essentially written out of the show after Mr. Song takes the credit for killing Kang so that Jin Woo can remain unnoticed. This is by far the thing that the series struggles with the most. In essence, if your name isn't Sung Jin Woo, you are not going to be getting much development. I'd say a solid 90% of the characters in this series more or less drop off the face of the earth as soon as Jinwoo becomes stronger than them. Even some of the S ranks that we get introduced to who are built up to be these super large figures just get dwarfed so quickly that they don't matter in the grand scheme of things. So with that in mind, here's a handy dandy list of the characters to look out for who actually make an impact on the story beyond just being temporary hurdles or having singular arc importance. We have Jinho, the D-Rank Hunter from the Lizard Arc. We have Chairman Go Gun Hee, who is in charge of the Hunters Association. Cha Hain, who is the second in command of the Hunters Guild. Dong Su, who is the brother of the guy who tried to kill Jin Woo in the Lizard Arc. Thomas Andre, who is in charge of one of America's biggest hunting guilds. And arguably, Sung Il Wan, who is Jin Woo's dad, and Sun Jin Ah, who is his sister. This is a 200 chapter story, and nowhere in that time is any real attention given to other characters to give them weight. Even this list is extremely generous, and in most cases they're here because they stay in the story, not so much because they influence things in any important way. Like sure, Jinho and Cha Hain have their own little story arcs here and there, but to say that their characters actually develop is a stretch. At best, they're one-dimensional, and at worst, they are satellites to Jinwoo. And what I mean by that is, like most other characters, any potential change for them is only focused around their interactions with Jinwoo. It's kind of unfortunate, but this is definitely the point in the story where you start to notice that literally no other character matters. From here, we get a small arc of Jin Woo helping Jin Ho clear some gates so that he can earn a Guildmaster license, and this continues until he hits level 40 and earns access to the Job Change quest. This functions very similar to the first instant dungeon. Back then, he had to learn to deal with wolves, monkeys, and panthers, all that attacked in specific patterns. And now, he has knights, assassins, archers, and mages. The big difference in this case is that Jin Woo cannot heal, or open his shop, and doesn't have access to most of the system's UI benefits. The only time that he is able to heal is through leveling up, and it's very much a slog through all these monsters where he becomes more and more exhausted until he reaches the boss room. Now because of this healing limitation, Jinwoo can't just grind endlessly here like he did in the instant dungeon. He can only go until he becomes too tired. 
and on top of this, the monsters just keep spawning so he never gets a chance to rest. He even decides to push back his daily workout quest because there's just no time to do it here. But at least the monsters drop some useful loot like a chest plate and even a gauntlet that has a palm that can't take damage. That all brings us to what is ultimately the biggest turning point for the series though. Jinwoo enters the boss fight and finds Knight Commander Igris the Red. This behemoth of a knight completely ragdolls him, whereas in the fight with Kang he was at least stronger or had abilities that he could use to turn the tide, Jinwoo has nothing going for him here. Igris is faster, stronger, and is devastatingly talented in swordsmanship, but he's also very chivalrous. When Jinwoo realizes that his daggers aren't going to be useful against a suit of armor like this, he drops them and chooses to fight with his hands, and seeing this, Igris does the same. So Jinwoo dives in, ready for a brawl, and gets launched across the fucking room. As Igris goes in for the kill, he picks up his sword again, but Jinwoo manages to catch it on the way down with that special gauntlet I mentioned, and using that opening, he resummons his dagger and stabs Igris in the eye, which ultimately leads to him defeating the boss. But there is no time for celebration, as after clearing this challenge, Jinwoo gets a notification saying, the job change quest will now begin. All of that was just the prelude. The real test is a survival mission involving a never-ending horde of knights emerging from a portal. But our boy still hasn't been allowed to heal, and dealing with complete exhaustion, he finds himself face to face with his own limitations once again. He starts thinking of all those people who considered him to be a burden as an E-rank, and goes into an absolute rage. He's violently swinging at the knights around him, and continues until he is literally too tired to move, and as the world begins to darken around him, he begins getting visions of Mr. Song and Juhi telling him that he has done enough, and that he has earned a break. Since awakening, Jinwoo has not stopped. Stagnation is death, and he had never allowed himself to slow his progression because he hated being weak so much, and now he is paying the price for that impatience and greed. He's visited by a vision of his past self who asks why he continues putting himself in these life or death situations when luck is the only thing that's kept him alive for so long. The old him continues by berating him, saying that he's gotten taller and more muscular, and he even looks stronger, but all of that is only appearances. He is still the same weakling who found himself in over his head, and now these knights were going to kill him just like the statues of the double dungeon. And again, it's all his fault. As the monsters continue to overwhelm him, the old Jinwoo warns that he still has very far to go, he will have to kill many more people, make many more sacrifices, and abandon his friends and family, and even after all of that, everything will eventually lead to his own death. And with that, a knight swings down to kill Jinwoo, and the timer on his daily workout expires as he is saved and sent to the punishment zone. And with that, all the old him can remark is that luck is also a skill, and that there must be someone who thinks it is a shame if it all ended here. I mean, obviously this is more plot armor bullshit, but at the very least it was hinted at earlier, and it falls into that same thing that happened with Cerberus where the system needs him to survive. That said, Homie just dealt with a whole dungeon and a cracked boss without being allowed to heal himself before immediately being thrown into a survival mission. As BS as the save here is, and it is BS, the situation he was in is also completely crazy, so it is what it is. But now that he is technically out of the dungeon, Jinwoo can open his shop and refresh himself. He still isn't able to heal, but at least he's not tired. That said, he does only have one HP left. The plan he comes up with in this situation is to overcome the challenge of not being hit, and then farm on the desert centipedes over the next four hours to level up enough to regain some of his health, but again, he is down if he even gets scratched. By the end of the penalty, he has reached level 51, bought himself a armor-piercing dagger, and even earned a new skill called Commander's Touch, which basically gives him the force. As he gets sent back to the dungeon, this power-up allows him to deal with the knights more effectively, as well as find and eliminate the mages who were summoning them. With that, Jinwoo manages to clear the test, having technically survived for four and a half hours, and because of this completely blowing past the expected results, 
Jinwoo earns the class of Necromancer, as well as a promotion to the Monarch of Shadows. Now this comes as a pretty big surprise for him as he's been shoving his stats into strength and agility, so a magic based class seems to not make sense. However, looking back, Jinwoo was never good at physical things. He was a character who could sense danger from experience and solved the riddles of the double dungeon. He is innately talented at intelligence and sense based skills, but he forced himself to be good at other traits that he believed would be more beneficial the things he saw in others and had become jealous of. By giving him the Monarch of Shadow class, the system basically hits him on the head and says, hey dummy, you're doing it the wrong way, this is what you need to do. And obviously there is more to this later, but at the very least, I like the idea of him starting to actually focus on what he's good at. Now, that said, this is the point where we shift away from the core pattern of the series, as well as that feeling of growth that has been so important to solo leveling as a whole. Going forward, it is very rare for something to feel like a challenge to Jinwoo, and that comes from being the Monarch of Shadows. What I mean by that is that this class allows him to summon the souls of the dead around him as shadow soldiers to fight for him. Now it's not really a foolproof system as the length of time that it's been dead or the power of the individual can affect the revive rates, but that becomes an issue like one and a half times throughout the whole series so you can kind of write that off. In practice, this means that Jinwoo can kill a group of monsters, then revive them, then use their shadows to kill slightly stronger monsters, which can then be revived, and used to kill stronger monsters, and do you see where I'm going here? It's an endless feedback loop where he gets a stronger and stronger army, and he can just sit on his ass the entire time. And this is made even more extreme as these soldiers can continuously respawn as long as he has mana available. So even if they are way weaker than the enemies, you can just spam them until they completely overwhelm them in time. After gaining this group of shadows, there is a potential that Jinwoo will never have to lift a finger again, and sure, he does stay somewhat involved in most fights, but it never really feels like that struggle that he's had to face every step of his journey so far. And I know this makes sense. At some point, he's going to be stronger than everything and everyone else around him. That's the whole conceit of the series. But that doesn't change the fact that the vibe of the story going forward is drastically altered. By no means is it a worse story, but the ability for the audience to put themselves in his shoes as the focus shifts away from his self-improvement and struggle is definitely more and more limited as time passes. As I mentioned though, it isn't like there is no plot going forward, but the quest to better himself instead becomes a quest to find his place in the system. All of this is exemplified as we enter the next arc. After leaving the job change dungeon, Jinwoo ends up on a raid with one of Korea's strongest guilds, the White Tiger. It's supposed to be a pretty low class gate, but once they enter it begins to turn red. Red gates like this are special for several reasons. Firstly, they are all at least high B rank, and inside the terrain is almost always extreme, in this case being a frozen tundra. Second, an hour on earth translates to a whole day inside the gate. And finally, you can't exit the gate until the boss is defeated. And this is about the point in the story where we are meant to see what Jinwoo is really made of. But to judge his strength, we need something to compare it to. So enter Kim Chul, the A rank hunter who is the leader of this raid. When he discovers that they are in a red gate, he splits their group into those with power and the dead weight. He leads all the upper ranked hunters towards the boss, while leaving the low ranks like Jinwoo behind. And let me tell you, with a group of powerful hunters, Kim Chul dominates everything that the dungeon has to offer, by which I mean they can barely deal with the fodder enemies, and he is quite literally the only survivor of his group. Meanwhile, we follow Jinwoo as he one-shots an ice bear before finding its den and clearing out a huge horde of them with his shadows which now means that he can replace all of his weak knights with an army of bears, again, becoming stronger without lifting a finger. Kim Chul eventually returns to the other group, but in doing so, he leads the dungeon boss and an army of ice elves towards them as well. And this dungeon boss, Baruka, is no joke. He is an s rank monster who is just stronger than Jinwoo, but more importantly than the actual fight is the discussion between Jinwoo and Baruka. Firstly, Jinwoo can actually understand this monster, which is new, but Baruka becomes the catalyst for him becoming more serious when it comes to learning about himself. 
Baruka begins their conversation by asking, What are you doing among the humans? You're not one of them. Obviously opening the possibility that there might be more to being a player than just a reawakening. Not only that, but the elf talks about the voice that all monsters hear in their head demanding that they kill humans, and how this voice disappears in the presence of Jinwoo. So in return, Jinwoo begins asking Baruka about who he is and where all the monsters come from, but the elf glitches out and starts repeating himself. The system doesn't believe Jinwoo is ready to hear this information yet, and as such, it will not allow Baruka to explain it to him. Now, the fight itself is pretty straightforward, with the exception of Kim Chul attacking Jinwoo out of jealousy and frustration, but as he tries, Igris kills him, and he is ultimately turned into a shadow himself. From here, Jinwoo's smaller shadows clear out all the elves, as Igris, Kim Chul's shadow, and Jinwoo take out Baruka together. Despite making it out of the dungeon alive, Jinwoo is left with more questions than ever, and is also pretty pissed that he failed to resurrect the dungeon boss. Again, the only time that this really happens throughout the whole series. Outside the gate, Jinwoo comes across an S rank for the first time in the leader of the White Tigers, Bayek Yunho. And it is here that Jinwoo sees that he is officially at the power of an S rank. With this confidence in mind, we finally return to the Demon Gate Castle, and we actually enter it this time. Now this place is basically Sword Art Online, just a hundred floors stacked on top of each other that Jinwoo will have to work through. And fitting to that, he also is given a quest where he must collect 10,000 demon souls from the monsters that live here, as well as collecting an entry pass that will allow him to progress to the next floor. And this is the point where incremental growth is more or less thrown out the window. In fact, while this place is definitely cool as hell, it also feels completely overlooked. At this first dive into this dungeon, Jinwoo clears 75 floors, and we skip the vast majority of them with the exception of a floor boss called Vulcan and another one called Metis. Despite so many floors being passed, we see like three or four of them, and I feel like it's just such a missed opportunity to really explore his growth a bit more. But it turns this thing that's kind of been built up for a while now, the Demon Castle, into like two quick boss fights that feel like nothing. And sure, when we return for the final 25 floors, there is some plot, but even that is mostly skipped over and it's just conflated with numbers to be plot devices for making Jinwoo more powerful without taking the time to actually flush that out. We're supposed to get here and think, wow, this dude just cleared 75 floors, he must be stronger now, but it is telling and not showing us that strength, and it is unfortunately a very big missed opportunity in my opinion. The big takeaway from this dungeon, though, is that our lad is much more powerful, and in defeating the bosses here, he finds a blueprint for something called the Holy Water of Life, a potion which potentially could be used to cure his mother of the eternal slumber, with each of the bosses in this castle dropping one of three of the required components, and with the final piece likely being held on floor 100. The Eternal Slumber, by the way, is effectively a coma that several people have fallen into because they're interacting with people who have a lot of mana and their body is sensitive to that. There's not supposed to be any kind of cure, and this is why Jinwoo has to work so hard to keep his mom's medical bills paid. Now, finding a cure for that is a good payoff for the Demon Castle in general, but I do wish that more time had been dedicated to Jinwoo thinking about his mother up until this point. It is largely something that we heard about at the very start of the story, and then just sits unmentioned on the back burner for like 50 chapters. Now, while all of this is going on, there is some stuff happening in America as well. Dong Su, the brother of the guy who tried to kill Jin Wu in the spider dungeon, is interviewing a man who emerged from a gate. And this guy is supposedly named Sung Il Wan, Jin Wu's missing father. These things don't really come into play for a while, but they are relevant enough that I should mention them here. As for Jinwoo, after returning from the Demon Castle, he is finally going to get re-evaluated. But because his mana levels are too high to check with normal machines, there's going to be a three-day delay while they set things up. That said, being off the charts like this tends to be the sign of an s rank hunter, so a few major guilds start trying to recruit him, namely the White Tiger and Hunter's Guilds. They aren't the only ones who are trying to approach him though, as he also has a meeting with the chairman of the Hunter Association, Go Gun He. And there's a line of dialogue here that I think very much encapsulates what part of the power fantasy we find ourselves in. 
He says, if the meter were capable of measuring the full range of your power, your results would have shown up as SS or SSS rank. However, no matter how many S's are added, the results still won't be an accurate measure of your power. A huge appeal of this story to this point is the struggle of growth. But by this point, we have arrived. Essentially, Jinwoo is the strongest person in the country, and even on the world stage, there's very few who compare with him. But in terms of storytelling, this means that power just stops meaning anything. Our only sense of understanding strength is the rank system that we have been given to work within. However, Jinwoo has surpassed that. This is no longer a story where we are comparing his strength to the world around him. Instead, we are comparing the world to Jinwoo. We are not looking up at other hunters or monsters, we are looking down at them, and it's a change in perspective that makes him feel larger than life. But even considering that, Jinwoo is still cautious in how he feels out the higher ranks though. Remember, he's jumping from essentially C rank dungeons to the demon castle, but how does that compare to the other gates? With this question in mind, he tags along on a Hunter's Guild raid as a miner to check out an a rank dungeon for himself, and here he meets Cha Hain. In meeting her, we have another instance of Jinwoo questioning his humanity, as she typically can't stand the smell of hunters because she is too sensitive to the smell they give off. But in his case, she finds him to smell rather pleasant for some reason. Raising the question, what really is a player if they are this different from a normal hunter? He eventually goes on a second raid with the Hunter's Guild, this time carrying bags, but things go very wrong as the orcs inside overwhelm the other hunters and eventually lock them inside the gate. The hunters get bodied by the leader of the orcs, and then Jin Wu feels like it is time to get involved. Out of courtesy, he had taken a back seat as to not steal the raid from the people who actually paid for the pass, but when they are going to die, that becomes less important. So he steps up to the orc leader, and we hear a familiar phrase as he calls Jinwoo a monarch. This word hasn't come up super often in the series, but it is the title of his class, the Monarch of Shadows. Whatever this monarch thing is, it leads the orc to question his meaning for life, as the voice that monsters hear demanding them to kill also comes from a monarch. Of course, the system starts glitching again as it can't have Jinwoo learn too much too quickly, and a fight breaks out where Jinwoo basically clears the boss fight effortlessly. However, he doesn't do this before Cha Hain or Wu Jin Chul arrive and see what he can really do. There's officially no hiding his strength anymore. And even if he wanted to, once he finally finishes the reevaluation, he is marked as Korea's 10th S rank, and this more or less makes him a celebrity overnight. Again, the S rank is kind of nebulous. It just means that their power isn't measurable, but that range is potentially limitless. Unmeasurable can be two off the top of the scale, or it could be a billion. Either way, they'll both be marked as S rank, and that's kind of what Chairman Go was talking about earlier. That said, where does Jinwoo compare out of Korea's 10 S ranks? Well, up until now, the two strongest hunters in Korea were Chairman Go and Cha Hain. Just following them would be the leader of the Hunters Guild, Choi Jong-in, and after him is Bayak Jun-ho of the White Tigers. But when we see Choi Jong-in size up Jinwoo, he immediately realizes that he has been completely dwarfed in comparison. And this, again, is a sign that we are comparing the world to Jinwoo rather than the system we have been working with in the past. And because Jinwoo is so much stronger than everyone else, it just doesn't make sense for him to join another guild if he is already the strongest. So instead, he and Jinho start their own guild, further cementing his place in the world around him. But with more and more of a spotlight being pushed on him, he does begin to worry about his family. So he attaches a shadow to his sister to keep her safe, as well as setting up a few around their home to build a kind of shadow neighborhood watch as well. Now that all the logistics are behind him though, he grinds up to level 81 and re-enters the demon castle, where he gets the quest to defeat Baron, the demon monarch. Which, as you might have guessed, is sitting 24 floors above him at the top of the demon castle. On his way up, he comes across best girl Essel, who is the culmination of all of the problems that the story has with writing side characters. They build her up, she joins the party, there's this promise to see her again later, and it's just, she's gone after. She doesn't matter, no matter how interesting a character seems in this series, they just don't matter, and that's so unfortunate. 
That said, she does offer a bit of lore. Unlike other monsters, she hears voices telling her to protect this place, as opposed to telling her to kill humans. Not only that, but apparently her and the others from the Demon Realm just woke up here one day, and they don't know how or why. When Jinwoo asks what they were doing before being here, she starts glitching out as she tells him that they were preparing for war. Eventually, Essel offers to guide Jinwoo to the leaders of the demon clans on each floor, as they are the ones who have the entry passes that he needs. And while it is cool seeing another party member for a bit, Honestly, this just acts as a way to allow us to skip all of the final floors and bring us to Baron unobstructed. And the Demon King kind of mirrors Jinwoo in the way he fights. He summons an army of demons to fight for him, but we get to add in that he rides a badass wyvern, which is like 10 bonus cool points that he didn't need. Ultimately though, all the soldiers go even, they start wiping each other out, and it comes down to a 1v1 between Jinwoo and Baron. However, because of the massive mana reserves needed to resummon his shadows, Jinwoo ends up falling into a bit of a desperate situation. Baron has this overwhelming strength, and as he closes in on Jinwoo, he begins charging a powerful beam attack from his mouth. And this is where something different happens. Jinwoo gets help. Essel had been struggling to decide which side of the battle she should be on. Should her allegiance be with the Demon King, since she is a demon, or should she help her new friend who was making her clan the most powerful by eliminating the stronger clans? She decides on throwing her weapon at Baron as he charges his attack, and this opening allows Jinwoo to turn the tide and kill the Demon Monarch. And with the castle officially complete now, he gets a few rewards. Firstly, he turns the wyvern into a shadow. Then he creates the holy water of life to cure his mother with. He gets a mystery key and a skill which allows him to swap places with any of his shadows. Now that last one is both super cool and a massive trap for the rest of the series. In the same way that gaining shadows changed the series by removing the sense that Jinwoo needed to struggle to improve himself, this ability also affects how the story is told. In practice, this in combination with Jinwoo placing shadows on others means that there is no tension in the rest of the story. We have someone who is essentially the strongest man on the planet now being able to show up anywhere at any time, with the only real limitation on this being that there's a 3 hour recharge time on this skill. So as long as he isn't using it willy nilly, there is no reason for anyone that he knows to get hurt ever again. And that's the downfall of a lot of power fantasies. At some point, the hero is just strong enough to do everything and save everyone. And when someone like Jinwoo can be anywhere, it removes so much pressure that things stop feeling like they matter. It's no longer a matter of how can we get the hero to the battlefield, it's a matter of how do we keep the hero away from the battlefield. Because if you don't, the conflict is just over immediately. Regardless, Jinwoo has an instant way out of the dungeon, so he promises Essel that he will return and just fucking dips. And just like that, she is completely written out of the story. We have this very cool character who builds up a quick bond with our hero, and she even gets a spark of growth as she chooses to help him against Baron, but then there's just no payoff and she's gone. It's the same problem we saw with Juhi, it's the same problem we saw with Mr. Song, and like everyone else that the story has suggested to be important but who ultimately gets left behind. But Jinwoo doesn't care about the hot, purple-haired demon girl anymore. He's got bigger things on his mind and rushes to the hospital where he heals his mom with the holy water of life, making her the first person to ever recover from eternal slumber. And looky that! Now we have a reason for Jinwoo to stay out from a major conflict. While he was in the demon castle, an ant had escaped from Jeju Island and started slaughtering a ton of people. Jeju Island, by the way, is where an S-rank dungeon broke and monstrous ants emerged from it completely taking things over. The entire island was basically marked as a no man's land and deemed unlivable for humanity. There were even a few efforts to clear the ants out, but no raid had ever been successful, and now these ants had survived long enough that they were starting to evolve and had started to escape the island on their own, so they have to be addressed. So, Chairman Go asks Jinwoo to help on a joint raid between Japan and Korea to eliminate the bugs, but he's not interested because he wants to make up for missed time with his mother. Which part of me gets, and the other part thinks is pretty darn stupid, because you got this army of ants that's coming one way or another. But either way, 
Jinwoo does attend a gathering of both countries' S ranks, where there's this 4 on 4 sparring match, and eventually, the leader of Japan's hunters, Goto Ryuji, challenges Jinwoo to a fight. Now, Goto is hot shit. People talk about him like he is God's gift to hunters, and he is considered to be the strongest person at the gathering by far. But in this sparring match, Jinwoo just plays with him. It gets to the point where Goto gets so frustrated that he even tries to kill Jinwoo, and the other S-Ranks jump in thinking that they need to stop them because their next attacks will definitely have resulted in one of them being killed. Before leaving the other hunters, Jinwoo plants his shadows on a few of Korea's S-Ranks, and with that, the raid begins as he heads home to his family. Japan is supposed to lure out all of the small ants, while Korea heads inside to kill their queen, and things go pretty well for the most part, but they quickly change with the emergence of the black ant. This is the ultimate soldier of the colony, and by far the strongest thing on the island. But we got a whole group of S-Ranks with an S-Rank healer. Nothing can go wrong. Oh, wait, nope. The healer is killed immediately, and his abilities are absorbed by the ant. That's not good. Everything looks horrible, but with no Jinwoo here to save them, there's nothing they can really do. The combined effort of all of Korea's S-Ranks is nothing against this monster, and things only get worse when he leaves to fight the king that he believes to be Goto, and recalls all of the rest of the island's ants to deal with Korea's hunters instead. Luckily, the raid was being broadcast on TV, Jinwoo sees what's happening, swaps in for one of his shadows that he placed earlier, and almost immediately clears all of the small ants with his shadows before reviving them into his own army. Which, whew, thank god we almost had a moment of tension there. Now, unlike his previous raids, this one is televised, and all of Korea sees what he is capable of. There is no more hiding his strength or his shadows. But at this point, it just doesn't really matter. Now, once the number of ants has been culled down quite a bit, he takes the opportunity to give potions to the surviving S-Ranks, though Cha Hain is too injured for this to work. What's worse is that the Black Ant finally returns after effortlessly killing Goto, and he challenges Jinwoo to a fight so that he can't even focus on saving Cha anymore. So how does the Black Ant, this monster who dominated two nations worth of S-Ranks, compare to Jinwoo? Well, he manages to leave exactly one scratch on him. The ant gets so frustrated by getting clowned on that he transforms into a more offensive version of himself, but Jinwoo just continues to throw him around. It gets so bad that the bug panics and tries to escape, but he's just slammed into the ground and killed like it's nothing. But this monster doesn't go to waste as he is resurrected and is made into Jinwoo's strongest soldier, being given the name Beru. This kill finally brings Jinwoo to level 100. There's no time to celebrate though, as he needs to resurrect the S-Rank healer that had been killed so that he can use them to save Cha Hain. and just like that, the island that had been sealed off for years is cleared by Jinwoo in a matter of minutes. The story had to try very hard to keep Jinwoo out of this raid from the beginning, because realistically he should have just gone with everyone else, but you know, family time. And then when tension is actually built up, they just pop him in there like it's nothing and the entire thing is resolved instantaneously. This is what I mean when I say there can't be tension in the rest of the series for as long as Jinwoo exists within it. Now obviously, this turns him from a Korean celebrity to someone known around the world, and he is approached by a man named Adam White from America who asks him to meet with his boss, who is the leader of the Hunter Management Bureau. In exchange for joining them, they offer Jinwoo a US citizenship and an upgrade. They apparently have this woman named Norma Selner who can upgrade a hunter's power by 30%. However, when she tries to do this for Jinwoo, she starts freaking out. Normally, she can see the hunter's connection to something otherworldly, but Jinwoo is different. His power doesn't originate from anything else, and instead it comes from the infinite darkness within himself. And because of that, it means that he's not borrowing his power, and that he has no limits. Which, if you remember, is basically what Kang said way back in the Prisoner arc. Not only that, but she mentions that Jinwoo is a king, something that she has experienced before, but never in this way. And obviously, king is a parallel for monarch, which we've heard many times at this point. But this all adds fuel to those questions about Jinwoo that he has been building up. But luckily, we are approaching the answer here. That mystery key that he had received for clearing the demon castle is finally revealing itself and leads him back to the Kartanon Temple. 
the double dungeon that everything started at. We get a bit of time focusing on some people who actually aren't Jinwoo before that though, imagine, as Cha Hain asks to join his guild because she has been simping over him since he saved her life, but that's, that's kind of it though, that's her arc. Going from arguably the strongest hunter in Korea to someone who simps for Jinwoo because he saved her, and that's kind of all there is to her. An interesting idea is posed here as we see her facing off against her fears in the entry test as Jinwoo has her fight Beru, and like that's a really cool moment, but ultimately Jinwoo doesn't let her join the guild anyways because he wants to remain a one-man operation, and that moment of potential growth is just like gone and wasted. Now aside from Cha Hain, there is also a small arc involving Jinwoo's sister Jin Ah. After he uses Shadow Exchange to meet with the Night Guild on a raid, his sister's school is attacked by a group of orcs, and Jinwoo needs to rush over to protect her, arriving at the very last moment. This teaches him to be more conservative with using Shadow Exchange, and leaves Jinnah with some serious PTSD, which will surely lead to something, right? Yeah, probably not. Anyways, finally, Chairman Go asks Jinwoo to ignore foreign offers like the USA was making and to remain in Korea. Jinwoo agrees to this, however, he asks to be allowed to enter gates alone and no longer need to follow the 10 person rule. As this rule was set up for public safety, it's kinda silly for him to have to abide by it if he's the strongest person on the planet. But as a formality, Chairman Go arranges for this to go ahead as long as Wu Jin Chul can follow him into one dungeon to make sure that he'll be okay. And almost immediately, he is blown away by what he sees. Jin Wu has a group of his soldiers clearing mobs, another group mining mana ore, and a third salvaging monsters' bodies. And even when an A rank boss shows up, Jin Wu beats it in one shot. So seeing this, it is decided by the Hunters Association that Jinwoo should not just be considered a one-man raid, but should be thought of as a one-man guild on par with any of Korea's others. Which honestly, is still kind of conservative. And finally, an S-rank gate emerges in Japan, but again, Jinwoo ignores a serious problem because it is time for him to head back to the Double Dungeon. Inside, Jinwoo approaches a statue holding commandments and is told that if he survives this final test, everything will be revealed to him. This normally wouldn't be too big an issue, but Jinwoo isn't allowed to use his summons or job-specific skills, meaning it's just him versus the statue in a 1v1. And during this fight, we learn that the commandment statue is actually the architect, the creator of the system that Jinwoo has been using. For defeating him, Jinwoo is given the opportunity to retrieve lost memories and sees a brief history of the original Monarch of Shadows, specifically him arriving to a war between monsters and silver angels. However, by turning all the dead soldiers on the battlefield into shadows, the Monarch is able to single-handedly turn the tide of this war. But despite this, even though he was the one who was winning the fight for the Monarchs, he was betrayed by the Monarch of Beasts and Baron the Monarch of White Flames. And while Jinwoo is seeing all these memories and begins to sync together with them, a black heart appears in his chest. Now, while he was having this flashback, several other hunters, including Cha Hain and Choi, all enter the double dungeon to help him after finding out that he had entered alone. The architect tells them that Jinwoo will be reborn as the true monarch of shadows once the memories are complete, and these hunters will be his first sacrifices. However, the Shadow Monarch doesn't emerge here. Instead, Jinwoo wakes up and protects all of the other hunters by killing the Architect, and as everyone leaves the dungeon, Jinwoo opens up briefly, but honestly, as he tells Wu Jin Chul about the system, making him really the only other person who knows the truth, which is kinda nice, actually. However, not everything is going well, as the world is kind of coming to an end. While the S-rank gates had been extremely rare in the past, really only once appearing in America and then on Jeju Island, all of a sudden they were appearing all over the place. Japan was the first, as we mentioned earlier, but now they had one in India and the UK and the USA again, and several other nations, with each potentially destroying the region that they appeared in if they aren't cleared within a week. And now luckily we do have the world's strongest hunter here, but unluckily after his fight with the architect, he's out cold for three days. By the time he wakes up, giants are already destroying Japan, but even so, he doesn't want to get involved. And this is added on to when Gina asks him to not go because she is still dealing with the trauma from the orc attack. It's a really heavy moment that gets completely overlooked. 
It's like a chapter before Jinwoo changes his mind, goes to talk to his sister while she's asleep, and basically says, Anyways, I'ma go. Sorry. And that's like the whole conversation, and we just never focus on her or her trauma again in the series, because her name isn't Jinwoo. And that's so unfortunate because it could have been something so cool to look into more. Now, over in Japan, there are giants taking over the city that the gate appeared in, but Jinwoo clears them out, enters the gate to finish off the boss, and here we have the second part of our lore dump for Jinwoo. The dungeon boss is Legia, the monarch of beginnings. He has been chained down and asks if Jinwoo will free him, and as a show of trust, he explains what he knows about the war that Jinwoo saw in his memories. The angels were beings called rulers, and all of the monsters in the battlefield served the monarchs, with these two groups being sworn enemies. Not only that, but the rulers were the ones who opened the gates around the world and filled them with monsters. And apparently there will be another war coming between the rulers and the monarchs, and Legia warns Jinwoo that he's going to be alone in this battle. As the Shadow Monarch, he is the natural enemy of the rulers, but he was also betrayed by the other monarchs in the past, meaning he's going to have the biggest target on him in this upcoming battle. That said, Legia does promise that if he is freed, he will help Jinwoo as an ally. Before letting him go, though, Jinwoo asks if he will stand with humanity, and when the monarch avoids the question, Jinwoo ultimately chooses to kill him. And with that, the conflict in Japan is over, and the S rank does dungeon is cleared. Now, this point in the story all feels very different from what we've seen so far. Like we've talked about, becoming stronger no longer matters, and learning about the Shadow Monarch isn't really in Jinwoo's control, so it honestly feels like a lot of waiting in most cases. And that might be why we've actually been taking a little bit of time to explore some of the side characters, even if very lightly. However, there isn't really enough time or follow through for any of them to end up feeling fully developed or even satisfying in any way. It's like we're being told, hey, look how interesting Cha Hain could have been, but then the writers just don't feel confident enough to commit and panic when Jinwoo isn't on the page, so we leave them all together. I think this lack of confidence is why, as we enter into the last section, of the story, things become even more focused on Jinwoo than they had in the past. This whole endgame section begins with Jinwoo flying to America, which not so subtly means he's leaving almost everyone he knows in Korea behind for a moment. On the way there, he finds out that his missing father had emerged from a gate and is the leading suspect in having killed a national level hunter, which he doesn't take super well, but while he is in America, some things do go his way. For example, he meets with the head of the Hunter Bureau and they offer him the runestone from Kamish, a dragon who was the boss of the first s rank dungeon. However, Jinwoo isn't really interested in the runestone, and instead asks to see the dragon's body. Naturally, he revives it as a shadow, but because he's been dead for so long, he fades away shortly after. Before Kamish passes on again though, he warns Jinwoo about four humans who have borrowed the power of the rulers. And speaking of, we get to meet one almost immediately. Remember Dong Su, the brother of the guy who attacked Jinwoo in the spider dungeon? Well, he has kidnapped Jinho and is torturing him to get revenge, but Jinwoo shows up and starts bodying the guy. However, because Dong Su is part of the Scavengers Guild, their leader, Thomas Andre, arrives and begins to protect him. Andre is one of those humans with the powers of the rulers, and he's considered to be the strongest hunter in the world. So, what happens when the most powerful hunter clashes with Jinwoo? I mean, if you've been following along, then you can probably guess Jinwoo dominates the dude. However, in the end, he chooses to spare Andre's life, as he realizes the dude is just filling his role as a guildmaster. This, again, showcases the problem with the series building up characters who aren't Jinwoo, though. Like, to this point, they have spent a lot of time talking up this Thomas Andre dude. He's had more build-up than any other secondary character in the story. Then we actually get to see what he can do, and it's just embarrassing. The story is becoming something like if Superman was put in a boxing ring with toddlers. Like, at what point does it just not matter how strong he is anymore? If no one is powerful enough to put up a fight, the value of strength in this power fantasy stops feeling satisfying, and we lean into a category more similar to One Punch Man, except this isn't a comedy, so it just doesn't feel right. But like, yeah, obviously it is fun to watch Jinwoo style on people, but the story is taking itself seriously. And at some point, fun just isn't enough on its own. We are officially beyond the point where humanity matters in this story, and we need to be introduced to a new force to bring any semblance of tension or weight back into things. 
which is why this is the point where the monarchs begin planning their assault in the background, so there is some hope for the future of the story. Now, we also have a bit of a human element of Jinru being explored through the conference, as he is surrounded by hunters questioning his loyalty. When a bounty is placed on his father, China's representative asks what Jin Wu will do if his dad needs to be killed. To this, he responds that as a hunter, it is his duty to slay monsters. However, if that monster still has his father somewhere inside of him, then Jin Wu will protect his family from all the other hunters in the world if necessary. It is a super cool scene, and when combined with how serious he got to save Jin Ho, it brings back that sense of humanity that had been slipping away from Jin Wu since he started becoming more powerful. It seems as though with the architect out of the way, the system is no longer trying to change him from who he was anymore. The final push towards showing us that Jinwoo does in fact still have a heart though, comes when the Frost Monarch arrives and tries to kill Chairman Go, as he is another human chosen by the rulers. Now, remember how I said that we need to create a reason as to why Jinwoo can't be everywhere at once because he has Shadow Exchange? Well, conveniently, the other monarchs can distort space, or something like that, they don't go into it too much, and that makes it so that his shadows can't relay information to him. It isn't until the seal around the monarch and Chairman Go is cracked that Jinwoo is made aware of the situation and can warp in, but by then it's too late. He scares the Frost Monarch away, but the Chairman is beyond saving at this point. As he dies, Go thanks Jinwoo for existing and asks him to stand with humanity when it becomes time to make a choice. But with his death, Jinwoo gets a personal vendetta against the Frost Monarch and promises Wu Jin Chul that he will avenge their friend. This all brings a lot back to the series that the previous section had been missing. When Jinwoo was learning about himself, he needed to wait to either meet a new enemy who could give him information, or until the architect was willing to open up to him. It was all completely out of his control. But now, Jinwoo has several goals in front of him. Find his father, and see if he's a monster. Avenge Chairman Go by killing the Frost Monarch. Prepare for the coming Monarch and Ruler War. These are all things that he can more actively work towards, and it gives the series a sense of direction again. Now, preparing for war is the easiest to work on, so Jinwoo starts sparring with his shadows to level them up. Not only that, but Thomas Andre shows up, and as a means of thanking Jinwoo for sparing him, he gives him a set of daggers made from Kamish. And finally, he spends some time with his family and even goes on a date with Cha Hain to get all of his affairs in order before things go down. And speaking of things going down, nine massive gates appear in the sky all over the world, and no one is able to enter them. Not only that, but other gates stop appearing altogether, which obviously makes people kinda nervous. But with those pieces in place, the stage is now set for the climactic arc, the Battle of the Monarchs. Things begin with the Monarchs of Frost, Plagues, and Beasts grouping together and Jinwoo showing up to battle them. He manages to kill the Monarch of Plagues, but the others get the upper hand and Jinwoo is actually overwhelmed for the first time since like a hundred chapters ago when he fought Igris. In fact, the two remaining Monarchs even manage to kill him, but as his HP hits zero, a hidden skill activates due to him having the Black Heart. When this triggers, Jinwoo wakes back up in the hospital from Chapter 11. This time, though, he has retained all 146 of his levels, as well as all of his inventory, his skills, his shadows, and memories. With this all in mind, he tries to live his life fixing all of the mistakes and saving as many people that he can. However, all the while, a notification keeps popping up asking him if he wants to restart the world. He tries to ignore it, but eventually he must face this choice, and he is approached by the original Shadow Monarch, Ashborn. If you remember all the way back to the job change quest, Jinwoo envisioned the old version of himself, but this was actually Ashborn speaking to him. And now that Jinwoo had become one with death by experiencing it, the Shadow Monarch was ready to show him the beginning and the end. The true story of what we had been dancing around for nearly 60 chapters at this point. And I'm going to be honest, this backstory is equally badass and confusing. I think I had to read the section like three times to actually understand what was happening all the way through, but that probably just came down to some of the wording and perspectives that we were given. We kind of learn about things from Ashborn's perspective, and there's a few moments that feel like other people just flip-flop their morality, which had me reaching the end and not really understanding who was supposed to be good or bad, but the story basically goes like this. 
In the beginning, there was an all-powerful deity called the Absolute Being. He took the primordial light and darkness and transformed them into the rulers and monarchs respectively, with the rulers being given the order to protect life while the monarchs were meant to destroy, all in the desire of creating balance. However, as these two forces opposed each other, an endless war broke out. The rulers, believing themselves to be in the right, approached the Absolute Being and asked him to help them defeat the monarchs. And it's my headcanon that he just didn't want to upset the balance, and this is the reason that he refused. However, the rulers couldn't understand this decision and came to the conclusion that this war that they were fighting was for nothing but the Absolute Being's entertainment. And if that's going to be the case, they were no longer going to serve him. So, seven of the eight rulers decided to rebel against him so that they could finally bring the war to an end. But the last and strongest ruler, Ashborn, opposed them. He tried to stop them, but as he was outnumbered, he ended up being defeated and left on death's door. It is here that Ashborn finds a special gift given to him by the Absolute Being. Unlike the other rulers, Ashborn could transform. And so, moments before his death, he receives a second chance at life as the King of the Dead and the Monarch of Shadows, which is very similar to what Jinwu was experiencing right now. With this new power, he returns to the battlefield, but he is too late. The rulers have already slaughtered the Absolute Being. And not only that, but in the process, they managed to capture Legia and sealed him away. This totally turned the tide of their battle. Seeing this balance fall apart, Ashborn joins the other monarchs and returns things to their natural order, but his power leads to jealousy. The Monarch of Destruction secretly convinces the monarchs of Beast and White Flames to betray him, and though he would manage to kill Baron, the Beast Monarch would escape. Not only that, but Ashborn's army was completely destroyed in this battle. This is when the rulers approached him and asked for forgiveness, but he was having none of that. He had lost his god after his fellow rulers turned against him, and now the monarchs were betraying him as well, and so he felt he had no place and just wanted to die and be set free from all of his suffering. For those keeping track, by the way, why did Jinwu want his power? Because in the double dungeon, after he saved so many people who did not believe in him, those people still ended up betraying him and leaving him for dead. He believed if he became stronger, he would never be betrayed again, and the more that we learn about Ashborn, the more their lives start to overlap. Obviously though, the rulers didn't want to kill Ashborn as he is so powerful and could be potentially very useful, so when they refused to kill him, he decided to go into hiding, hoping he could rebuild his army and take revenge on the Beast Monarch. That said, again, he would be too late. With he, Legia, and now Baron out of the picture, the monarchs are completely overwhelmed by the force of the rulers, and they are made to go into hiding. The remaining monarchs arranged to invade Earth and fight the rulers again once they were back to full strength, but the rulers had a special tool to help them, the Cup of Reincarnation, which allowed them to turn back time 10 years, which they would use to prepare Earth. You see, a world without mana could not survive the battle between monarchs and rulers, but let's say the rulers could create gates filled with monsters and mana stones and awaken some of humanity so that they could learn to fight back while powering up up the world with the resources they gained in raids. This is why the dungeons were created by the rulers. This was really their only form of defense, but no matter how hard they tried, the monarchs would always win and the cup would need to be used again. This happened so often that it basically leaves the cup empty with at best one use remaining. However, on the final attempt, something different happens. Ashborn had followed the monarchs to Earth looking for a place where he could belong in the universe, but because he was so powerful, he couldn't find a suitable vessel. This is when the architect approached him and offered to help him in exchange for immortality. Ultimately, together they would find Jinwu and selected him to become a player, someone who could level up and become powerful on his own as they were slowly drip-fed Ashborn's power and eventually could become a perfect vessel for him. Now, with the introduction of Ashborn's vessel in the timeline, that leaves the question, is this enough to stop the monarchs? After sharing his story, Ashborn offers Jinwu a choice. He can remain in this perfect dream world that he had created, or he could return to life and continue the fight against the monarchs. Without any hesitation, Jinwu calls out Arise and revives himself as the true Shadow Monarch, deleting the system and removing all limits on his power. 
When he wakes up, he finds that his father had been protecting him from the remaining monarchs, but once he rejoins the fight, his dad vanishes. Regardless, our boy is at full strength now, and we get to see him showing off against Beast and Frost. The Beast Monarch wants nothing to do with this and teleports to some far off place, but within a matter of seconds, Jin Wu finds him and emerges out of his shadow before killing him in just four hits. He then returns to the Frost Monarch, and when the enemy tries to stab him, his weapon literally crumbles on impact. And from there, it would only be a few more moments before Jin Wu killed the Frost Monarch as well, and finally avenged Chairman Go. After the fight, Jin Wu finds his father, and his dad explains that he failed to leave a dungeon after killing a boss, and had been trapped in the rift between dimensions until the rulers approached him and gave him a second chance at life, if he promised to kill the monarchs. Once they discovered that his son was the new Monarch of Shadows, though, the rulers changed his priorities to instead become to protect Jin Wu. Their time together wouldn't be super long-lived, but Jin Wu tells his dad about how much he hated him for disappearing, and how every time he left for a mission or made it home to his sister and his mom, he began resenting his father more and more. But despite that feeling, he still missed him the entire time. And with this context in mind, it adds a lot to how Jin Wu clung to life in each dungeon. Yes, he was the weakest E rank and he was always in over his head. Yes, he was always injured or hospitalized after each raid, but he could never allow himself to die because this would hurt his mom and sister in the same way that his father had hurt them before. These two eventually hug in a very tear-filled moment, however, Ilwan's time runs out as he has taken too much damage in the fight against the monarchs. And so, he fades away in his son's arms, leading Jin Wu to pledge to destroy the monarchs for what they had did to his father. And now, we are in the endgame. Following this, the gate in the sky finally opens, but it isn't monsters that emerge from it. Instead, an army of 100,000 shadow soldiers come forth, and this is Ashborn's real army. They have finally made it to Earth, and now that Jinwu has taken their master's place, they will all serve him. From here, we can jump to preparing for the final battle. With eight other gates around the world, it's unclear where the final monarchs will show up or how many soldiers they will bring, but ultimately, they're entirely entire force shows up in Canada, the farthest point from Korea, which will give them the most time to destroy things. And it really would not take long before Canada is essentially wiped off the map. And so Jinwoo needs to make his move as well. He warps to America, collects Kamish's runestone, and visits Selner for a psychic reading. She asks him if he's really planning to sacrifice himself for everyone else, knowing that they won't even remember him, and he starts smiling because this reaction means that his plan will work. Finally, before heading to the battlefield, he calls Cha Hain one more time, and he promises that he will come see her again no matter what. These are all very small moments that do a lot in the foreshadowing department. When he arrives in Canada, Jin Wu attacks on two fronts. Firstly, he goes in alone and kills as many soldiers from the Army of Destruction as he can, before summoning their shadows to fight for him. Meanwhile, he sends Thomas Andre to another location to draw out the Iron Body Monarch, only to have all of Jin Wu's actual army pop out of Andre's shadow and kill the monarch almost instantly. Antares finally shows up and chases Jin Wu through a portal, and by using the skill he gained from Kamish's runestone, he makes an opening to bring the Monarch of Destruction to an isolated island on the other side of the world. It would fight here until morning, but Jin Wu secretly sets up a trap similar to what the Frost Monarch had done when he attacked Chairman Go. By creating a dimensional pocket around their battlefield, he could buy time for the rulers to arrive undetected, and when the conflict finally broke that seal, the rulers could swoop in and finish off Antares. Now, it does feel like kind of a cheap win, but at the same time, it takes advantage of the way of thinking that allowed Jin Wu to survive so long as an E rank. It is quick thinking, planning, adapting to his situation, all of his strengths that allow him to defeat the one person alive who could compete with him. The rulers offer Jin Wu a reward for helping them end the war, and he makes a very bold wish, asking them to use the Cup of Reincarnation for the final time. As a monarch, Jin Wu would be able to keep his memories and power when time is turned back. And so, he asks the rulers to not set up gates on Earth this time, and instead just allow him to take care of the monarchs on his own. He knows the risks and the sacrifice that this will involve, not to mention all the friends and family that he will have to leave behind in this world, but these are all the things that Ashborn had warned him about way back in the job change quest. He had already made peace with this reality. 
With that in mind, he believes that all of this will be worth it if he can avoid the countless deaths and losses that this world had experienced since the gates had appeared and the monarchs attacked. And so he will go back, carry all of the burden on his own, and save everyone this time. And in doing so, he would fulfill his promise to Chairman Go by choosing to stand with humanity. He arrives back in time as a child and finds his father still at home. And it's this really sweet moment where he starts crying because he's so happy. Ultimately, he would choose to spend some time enjoying this life, but would eventually need to make his sacrifice. So he leaves a note for his parents, saying he will return when he can, and then dives into the world of endless darkness for the next two years. However, time in this dimension works differently, and Jinwoo would spend 27 years in isolation until he managed to kill all of the monarchs on the other side. When he finally returns home, he is approached by a messenger of the rulers, and they ask if he wants to remain in this world, or go to a new one, saying that his overwhelming mana might have an effect on the world around him. But Jinwoo chooses to stay, even though he's unsure of his role on Earth now that he is effectively an immortal monarch. Again, we are paralleling Ashbourne who went to Earth searching for purpose. But Jinwoo has something that Ashbourne never did. He happens to see Cha Hain running by in this moment, and chooses to remain in this world for the people that he loves, and for the people who love him. And with that, the story ends as Jinwoo fulfills his promise and makes it back to Cha Hain. So, Solo Leveling's main story ends here. It is a whole power fantasy journey that has you experiencing struggles and growth through Jinwoo's eyes. However, it offers something more than just a feeling of power. It very quickly moves beyond that and explores themes of self-improvement and reflection, finding meaning, and the value and responsibility associated with power. This is by no means a perfect series. I think I've spent more than enough time covering the issues to prove that. However, it is one that I really enjoyed and found value in, despite being extremely cliche and power fantasy trash. Typically, this is where I'd be ending my review, but the story doesn't quite end here. Chapter 179, the main ending for the story, has a message from Dubu. He was the one responsible for this webtoon adaptation of solo leveling, and the art and the love that he supplied this story with can be felt in literally every page. It's not an exaggeration to say that visually this was one of the most stunning and enjoyable experiences I've ever had with this kind of medium. Like, some of these panels are just stunning and feel so much larger than life that it really makes solo leveling feel like something special, and that's why I was so interested in his final thoughts on it. In this note, at the end of the final chapter, he says, Thank you for showing my webtoon so much love, despite its flaws. I've learned a lot from taking on this new challenge, and all the love this series has received made me feel both happy and humbled. He then goes into very heartfelt and personal thanks to everyone who helped make this project a reality, but then he continues, I will try to work harder from here on out. Thank you. Life is an endless quest where you must level up constantly, sometimes alone, sometimes with company, and therefore I'd like to wish luck to all of my readers on their remaining journey. Thank you for showing Soul Leveling so much love. Until next time. Honestly, I had never heard of Dubu before solo leveling, but just from reading this short note, you really get a feeling of the kind of humble and genuine person he was. He had just succeeded in creating one of the most successful webtoons of all time, and all he had to say was thanking his fans for loving it despite its problems, and then showing appreciation to all the people that many others in his position might have overlooked. And having completed this journey, all that was on his mind was trying even harder next time a life philosophy that is so fitting to what solo leveling is. But unfortunately, there wouldn't be a next time. Dubu would pass away from a cerebral hemorrhage very soon after solo leveling ended, and as such, the epilogue was dedicated to his memory. This extended ending for the story covers chapters 180 to 200 and follows Jinwoo's new life. You see him coming across plenty of old faces, finding his place in this new world, and marrying Cha Hain. They even have a son named Suho. I'm not gonna lie, not every chapter in this section is a banger, but there is this overall feeling of love that permeates through the entire thing. 
It isn't the same old story at all. The vibe is very, very different, but it's nice. It's warm. It feels lived in. And it came with a wave of new life being breathed into the series that I cannot understate the value of. That said, I think once Suho becomes the focus, it really feels like experiencing the best parts of solo leveling all over again. And when they parallel him and Jinwoo together, it, it really chokes you up. However, what really broke me was the final notes for the series. Dubu's disciples write about him being the great pillar who supported them and helped them grow, as well as how much they miss and cherish him for everything that he was. After the little bit I've been able to learn about Dubu, I really feel like the world has lost someone truly prolific and special. He was someone who managed to impact so many lives all around the world while inspiring and cultivating all the people who knew him personally. We spent a lot of time talking about what power means in this video and what the value of power is, but even more so than having the strength to fight monsters or demons, true power comes in the form of being able to make those around you better, to prop up, support, and motivate others. And in that sense, I believe that Dubu is the definition of powerful, and I hope he rests in peace knowing all the good he put out into the world. Thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, I hope you all stay excellent.